Um, today, we're going to talk about facing discrimination. And uh, the three greats we're going to talk about are Dorothy Reed, who made uh, fundamental advances in the study of Hodgkin's disease, and then two key players in the Blue Baby operation, uh, Helen Tausig. Uh, uh, it was probably her idea, and Vivian Thomas, the enormously skilled uh, technician who made it uh, possible. Um, and again, uh, my disclosures, uh, a history based on uh, uh, biography uh, is fraught with challenges. As Osler said, what more delightful in literature than biography, and yet how uncertain and treacherous is the account which any man can give of another's life. And I'll emphasize again at the end of the lecture, uh, for those of you who are interested in a deeper dive in medical history, the uh, uh, Department of History of Medicine has a wonderful online course that they offer. Um, and I encourage uh, those of you who are interested to, to look into that. So the objectives are simple, uh, to recognize that uh, racial and gender bias and other biases marked Hopkins in the past, and consider the lessons that the way these three were treated hold for us uh, today. I'm gonna to start with Dorothy Reed. Uh, Dorothy was born in Columbus, Ohio to a wealthy family, uh, as is a theme for a number of the people presenting today. Her father or one of her parents died when she was only six years old. In 1895, she graduates from Smith College and she must have been extremely smart. She went on to MIT and did one year of physics and chemistry at MIT. In 1896, she then enters uh, Hopkins Medical School as, the mem as a member of the class of 1900. And in that class, it was the fourth uh, class here in the School of Medicine. Uh, there were 38 men and 12 uh, women. Um, and she tells the story on her first day arriving at Hopkins um, uh, that uh, she exited a streetcar and a well-dressed man approached her and asked, are you uh, entering uh, gesturing towards the School of Medicine. Uh, she answered yes and don't, he said. She didn't had no idea who this man was until later in the day when she had to present herself to the, uh, to the professors. And uh, Welsh was there and went over her uh, transcripts and said, okay, you, you may enter the medical school. She left the room and asked her colleague, who was that man with a mustache sitting next to Welsh? And, and they said, well, that was Osler. And indeed, Osler was the one who uh, when she arrived, said, don't come. Now, I have absolutely no idea why he said that. Uh, he had an unusual Victorian sense of humor. And throughout her career, he was uh, actually a, a strong supporter of her uh, when she was at Hopkins. And she told the story one night that a number of patients on her service when she was an intern died. And she was uh, waiting for the other interns to humiliate her for the large number of deaths. And Osler uh, stepped up and said something to the effect that, well, that happens to all of us, doesn't it? And of course, no one was willing to poke fun at her when Osler uh, said it had also happened to him. Uh, so this is a picture of, of uh, Dorothy Reed here as a Hopkins medical student. Um, and uh, she graduates in 1900. She's the right here, the fifth one from the left. And oddly enough, she was also the fifth in her class. Um, uh, she uh, graduated, as I mentioned, tied fifth in her class. And based on her rank, she was one of two women. The other was uh, Florence Sabin, uh, who is a, a famous, became a famous scientist, who were eligible for an internship under Osler on the, in the Department of Medicine. Uh, but if there were going to be two female interns, then one of them would have to treat male patients on the black ward. And um, uh, there was great opposition to a female uh, uh, treating uh, the, uh, the black uh, patients. And Hurd, who was the uh, head of the hospital, said it would be a disaster. It couldn't be done. Um, and uh, she, and in fact, they felt it was there, she, the perversion is the word that was used. Um, she was tough as nails, though. And um, uh, she said to Hurd, until Osler returns, he was out of town at the time, Sir, I shall be the intern on the colored wards. If in October I find that I cannot successfully complete my duties, I shall tender Osler my resignation. And of course she did not have to do that. And here you can see a, a picture of one of the wards and notice that all of the patients are black and all of the nurses and doctors are white. Um, and indeed this is the ward, a building uh, called the colored ward, the wards M and O in 1890. Hopkins was a, a segregated institution. 
Um, and uh, despite this opposition, maybe because of it, she tried uh, harder. And to quote from her, something Dr. Hurd said of a woman's being irresponsible and not trusted to see things through kept me at my post. She was the first intern to arrive in the morning and the last to leave at night. And uh, she, in her uh, uh, autobiography, wrote that she averaged three to four hours of sleep a night. It's just incredible. Um, and it wasn't just all, all science and medicine. Uh, tells a story that she, and one night she had to break up a fight uh, by swinging her crutch around and, and yelling back to your own wards to the, to the patients. Um, but her black patients were deeply uh, grateful to uh, her for the excellent care she provided. And one of them, as he was dying, handed his wallet to her with it, all of his money. Uh, of course, she did not accept it. Um, after completing her internship, she was interested in science and uh, uh, took on a fellowship in pathology and uh, uh, completely really remarkable uh, studies in pathology. At this time in 1901, the Australian uh, pathologist Sternberg had minced lymph nodes from patients suffering from Hodgkin's disease, which today we know to be a form of cancer. And he placed them in guinea pigs and some of the guinea pigs he thought developed tuberculosis. So he said, well, uh, what this disease with big lymph nodes must be a form of tuberculosis. And uh, in fact, there was the general feeling at the time that Hodgkin's disease was a, a peculiar form of tuberculosis. Um, but she, just in creative, detailed, and impactful science, uh, really studied uh, Hodgkin's disease uh, in animals uh, and uh, also under the microscope. Um, so she uh, recorded the results of tuberculosis skin tests on patients. She studied their tissues under the microscope, and she even repeated Sternberg's experiments, inoculating animals with ground up lymph nodes from patients with Hodgkin's disease to see if they developed tuberculosis, and the animals did not. And, and to uh, quote from her, I cannot understand this conception of the tuber tu tubercle bacillus uh, or tuberculosis, which he suggests is the cause of such a growth. I have little difficulty in distinguishing the two processes. And here you can see a, a child uh, with uh, tuberculosis. Um, and in fact, she studies it under the microscope and uh, identifies these large cells, which are illustrated here, that in fact, uh, rather than tuberculosis, are the characteristic cells. And these are the cancerous cells, if you will, of tuberculosis. Uh, she called it the large giant cells are the most striking feature of these specimens. They vary in size of two to three red corpuscles or red blood cells to cells 20 sign, times their size. The nucleus is always large. It may be single or multiple. She's only 28 years old and she makes these uh, observations. And she writes this incredible paper at the time um, at, uh, on, the on the pathological changes of Hodgkin's disease with a special reference to its relation to tuberculosis, which was none. It's a single author paper, as you can see. It's 65 pages long, if you can imagine that. 65 pages long, and she's just a fellow. And she illustrated it. Um, and here you can see one of the illustrations, and you can see her initials uh, down here, Dorothy Reed. And this is such a classic uh, illustration. I think if you showed this to any uh, third or fourth year medical school student or resident or pathologist, in an instant, they would say Hodgkin's disease. Um, and in the lower left corner, this cell, the binucleate cell, is really a uh, classic. And she's the one who illustrated it. Um, how is she then uh, treated after this? Um, she's denied a faculty position here at Hopkins. Um, uh, and in her conversations with William Welsh, she said, I explained that the man who had the fellowship just before me had done no research, but had been made an assistant in pathology the next year. Why not I? Well, she answered that no woman had ever held a teaching position in the school and that he knew there would be great opposition to it. And as Dorothy, uh, Dr. Reed said, suddenly I, as I saw what I had to face in acceptance of injustice and in being overlooked, I knew that I couldn't take it. And I told Dr. Welsh that if I couldn't look forward to a, a definite teaching position, even after several years of apprenticeship, that I could not stay. Um, there was also a, apparently a love affair involved. Uh, a, a young man she called AJ, and she referred to him a tall, good-looking, well-bred, smart young man who was already uh, prominent in his field. 
And uh, she felt that uh, uh, influenced by the, and this is a quotation from her, influenced by the necessity of not seeing him constantly if we were not to marry, apparently he did not want to marry her. I decided to leave Baltimore uh, to go out of pathology and take up pediatrics as a profession. So here this rising superstar uh, leaves uh, pathology and leaves uh, uh, Hopkins. Um, the, her, uh, almost certainly her, uh, her lover at the time was William McCallum, who went on to become the chairman of the department eventually. And he wrote the standard textbook of pathology. And in his book, he often referenced Dorothy Reed, uh, clearly giving her credit for the discovery of, uh, of the cell that causes Hodgkin's disease. And I circled uh, some of the uh, lines from his textbook in which he's uh, uh, identifying her as the discoverer and in many ways uh, helped bring her fame. Um, and indeed now the diagnostic cell of Hodgkin's disease is called the Reed Sternberg cell. It bears her name and appropriately so. Um, so after leaving Hopkins, she goes to New York. Um, and in 1903, Welsh helped her get a, a, a residency at the New Babies Hospital in New York City. Uh, the, super, the assistant superintendent, and I, I love this name for an assistant superintendent of the time, it seems very appropriate, Miss Smiley, uh, met her at the door and said, yes, she was expected. No, there was no other doctor on duty. So she arrives at a hospital and there's no other doctor on duty. Uh, Dr. Holt was in Florida. Uh, the, so Dr. Holt had left uh, Dorothy Reed alone uh, with no instructions in charge of all the babies in the entire hospital. And not only that, he did not keep medical records on his babies. Um, so there, there was no way to know what diseases they suffered from. Uh, but she was uh, uh, smart and uh, had great ingenuity. And so she started to examine the babies and then figured out that they were uh, clustered by diagnosis. You know, the kids with diphtheria were over here. The kids with heart disease were over there. Um, and she was able to group the kids and, and, and treat them uh, uh, until uh, Dr. Holt arrives. So just, I think, really speaks uh, uh, miles to, to her ingenuity. Um, her sister dies in 1903 and leaves uh, Dorothy Reed to care for her sister's three children. In 1906, she marries uh, Elwood Mendenhall, uh, Mendenhall a professor of physics, and they move to Madison, Wisconsin, and that's where she lived the rest of her life. Um, her life was not easy uh, by any, any means. And uh, when she went into labor, she was horrified by the care she received. The doctor hadn't washed his hands properly and he unsuccessfully tried to turn her baby, a procedure called aversion. Uh, and sadly, this uh, baby was born breech and died uh, after 20 minutes. And so the loss of her baby really motivated uh, uh, Dr. Reed to fight infant mortality throughout her life. Um, she compared the infant and maternal mortality rates in Denmark to those in the United States and concluded that American mortality rates were higher uh, because of unnecessary medical procedures. And she became a strong advocate of natural childbirth and, and following the Danish uh, model. Um, and uh, uh, years later in 1937, uh, Madison, Wisconsin had one of the lowest infant mortality rates of any city in the United States. And I'm sure it's because of uh, Dorothy Reed. And she publishes this uh, wonderful piece, uh, Milk, the Indispensable Food for Children. What a, what a wonderful title. Um, again, has a hard life. In 1905, she suffers a cardiovascular arrest. She arrests from hypersensitivity reaction to diphtheria antitoxin uh, that was raised in horses. Apparently, she was afraid of contracting diphtheria from the many children she, she treated, so she would give herself uh, these antitoxin injections and had a reaction and almost died uh, from one. In 1909, she has a minor surgery to remove two small moles. And uh, unbelievably, uh, instead of an anesthetic, the nurse accidentally fills the syringes with acid. And this results in a terrible scarring and obviously pain uh, to her. Her son, died, Richard, uh, falls to his death at the age of two. So she's just really has a, a very, very hard life. Um, her husband dies of pancreatic cancer in 1934, and she uh, survives another uh, uh, 30 years and dies at the age of 90 in 1964.
Um, and uh, uh, Bill Jarrett uh, kindly shared this with me. I didn't, wasn't aware of it, but her son, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, became the president of Smith College. And uh, there's a Sabin Reed Hall at Smith College named in honor of Dorothy Reed and Florence Sabin. Remember, I, I mentioned she was tied for fifth in her class with Florence Sabin, uh, both of the Hopkins Medical School of 1900. And you can see the name here, Sabin Reed Hall at Smith College. It's the Science Hall. Uh, so when I think of Dorothy Reed, I think of bravery, uh, intelligence, and strength in the face of hardship and discrimination. And of course, I think of the Reed Sternberg cell, which you can see here in, in this uh, uh, photo micrograph. Uh, again, anyone who is trained in medicine will recognize this in an instant as the Reed Sternberg cell. Um, and it's interesting to, to think of her career um, uh, when we think of uh, Mary Elizabeth Garrett's vision for female faculty. We talked about her vision for the students and how she was able to battle Gilman and get women admitted to Hopkins Medical School, but she also had a vision for female faculty here at Hopkins. Um, in her will, Mary Elizabeth Garrett left her fortune to Carrie Thomas, uh, who remember was up at Bryn Mawr College. Had Garrett survived Carrie Thomas, uh, there was a, a 11th article or article 11th in Garrett's will stipulated that much of her fortune would go to the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine if and only if uh, Hopkins provided equal opportunities for women faculty. Um, uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Carrie Thomas uh, outlived Mary Elizabeth Garrett, and we don't know how things would have been different had, had it been the other way around. So our second great is Helen Tausig. And uh, uh, Helen was born in uh, 1898 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her father was apparently a brilliant economist at Harvard and her mother was one of the first graduates of Radcliffe College. Uh, uh, Helen Tausig's mother died of tuberculosis when Helen was only 11. And uh, Helen apparently also contracted TB from her mother. Uh, she struggled with uh, severe dyslexia, um, but um, uh, was clearly also just extremely smart. Uh, she studied at Radcliffe for two years and then transferred to University of California where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa in 1921. She wanted to go into public health, uh, but the dean of the Harvard School of Public Health told her that although she could attend school, he would, uh, she would not be awarded a degree. And I, I love her response. Who wants to study for four years and get no degree for all that work? Nobody, I hope. Uh, she was uh, tough. Um, and as she wrote, it was one of those times in life when what seemed to be a disappointment at the time later proved to be a great opportunity. So she comes, uh, starts first at Boston University in medical school and then transfers to Hopkins uh, for the last two years uh, in medical school. And uh, she starts to lose her hearing and she later develops profound hearing loss. Uh, she graduates in 1927. And I think she's here in the back of, of this photograph. Um, but uh, just as uh, Dorothy Reed was, she was uh, denied an internship in medicine. Uh, because there was another woman who had already been accepted and they didn't want two women uh, on the service. Um, so instead, she goes into pediatrics uh, and is an intern in pediatrics under Dr. Edward Park. Um, and in 1930, he uh, appoints her to be head of uh, a, a pediatric cardiology uh, in the Harriet Lane which was home, which was what pediatrics was called at the time. And it re quite remarkably, she leads uh, pediatric cardiology here at Hopkins for 33 years. Uh, what a remarkable uh, treatment, uh, achievement. She institutes careful clinical exam, blood pressures in each arm because some of the congenital abnormalities, you get different blood pressures in different arms, um, and uh, x-rays with barium swallow to help define the shape of the heart. And here you can see Helen Tausig on the right with a, a, a little baby. Um, she uh, studies uh, not only her babies carefully, but their hearts, and uh, wrote uh, one of the classic textbooks on uh, malformations, congenital malformations of the heart. A um, uh, uh, number of the babies she treated were so-called blue babies. Uh, these are babies who are cyanotic because not enough blood was getting into their lungs. And uh, these babies sadly died at a, at a very young age. 
she uh, was very observant and observed that some of the, the babies, some of her patients died when this structure in, in, uh, in between their great vessels called the ductus arteriosus closed. And then if the ductus didn't close, uh, and she knew it didn't close, not because they had catheterization or anything, but because she could hear that they had a continuous heart murmur, the babies lived. And so it's illustrated here. So the, these are babies who have an obstruction of the, of the pulmonary valve or that area. So no blood is flowing into the lungs marked in blue, but babies who had an adductus, and that's the connection, connection here between the aorta and the uh, pulmonary artery, were able to get blood into their lungs. Oops. Um, and so she, when this closed and, and this valve was closed, the babies got no blood in their lungs and they died. But if this remained open abnormally, then the babies lived. And she made this quite remarkable uh, observation just by listening carefully. Um, so she reads an article by a, a surgeon, Robert Gross, um, that, uh, in Boston, that in which he surgically closed a patent ductus arteriosus. And so she travels up to Boston and says to him, uh, what about turning that idea upside down, keeping the vessel open as a way to increase blood flow and help the cyanotic patient? And uh, Gross uh, flatly turns her down. As he said, she remembered him saying, I have enough trouble closing the ductus arteriosus. I certainly don't want to try to make an artificial one. And so he, he loses an opportunity to be uh, transformed pediatric cardiac surgery. Um, she comes back to Hopkins after a trip and there's a new head of uh, surgery, Alfred Blaylock comes. And uh, he comes to Hopkins in 1942 from Vanderbilt to head the Department of Surgery. And she, uh, Dorothy Re uh, excuse me, Helen Tausig, uh, goes to Alfred Blaylock and says, your work today was great, but if you could build me a ductus instead of closing one off, build me for one of my babies, then it would really be a great day. And uh, uh, now Blaylock says, when that day comes, what I did today will look like child's play. But she challenges him uh, to try and build a, a ductus arteriosus to save these uh, blue babies. And uh, Alfred Blaylock uh, turns uh, to the lab and turns to uh, the technician he had in, in his lab, an extremely talented Vivian Thomas, uh, and asks Vivian to try and uh, create this operation in dogs that Helen Tausick had suggested. suggested. Uh, Vivian was born in uh, 1910 in New Iberia, Louisiana. He's a grandson of a slave. He uh, has a high school education and then hopes to go to college. He was clearly very smart, um, but uh, the Great Depression hit and instead he has to work. He works part of the time as a very skilled carpenter. Um, and then um, when he loses that job, comes to work for uh, Dr. Blaylock at Vanderbilt University as a surgical assistant. At that time they were studying shot. Um, for pay, even though he was a very skilled uh, technologist, uh, Vanderbilt classified him as a janitor and gave him a janitor's pay. Um, uh, interesting side uh, light, his uh, side note, his brother Harold Thomas, uh, his older brother was a school teacher in Nashville and uh, Harold uh, Thomas sued the Nashville School Board, uh, uh, Board of Education uh, for uh, salary discrimination based on race. And with the help of a young uh, lawyer, uh, Thorogood Marshall, uh, uh, Harold Thomas wins his case, but unfortunately loses his uh, job. So Vivian Thomas uh, uh, came with Blaylock to Hopkins in 1941, and uh, Al Blaylock uh, charged Vivian Thomas uh, with the task of first creating a blue baby-like condition in dogs and then correcting the condition as Helen Tausig had suggested. Uh, and what they did is uh, taking the artery to the arm and then anastomosing the artery to the arm to the artery to the lung. And in this way, you could get blood flow to the lung. Um, and he, they did it on dogs. And this is one of the dogs that survived. And I think it's one of the, or maybe the only portrait in the School of Medicine's portrait collection of an animal. And the dog was Anna. Here you can see uh, in the center is uh, Vivian Thomas uh, operating a dog leg. I, I think this is actually operating at Vanderbilt, uh, but you get the sense of, of uh, a talented uh, uh, and skilled surgeon. Um, I love this picture. This is a picture of the surgical needles that Vivian Thomas uh, used. They look like sewing needles. You know, they're not the small delicate things. He often would have to trim them and sharpen them himself. 
Um, so you get a, get a sense of the primitive conditions uh, they were working on at this time. And uh, Vivian Thomas even created and adapted special clamps uh, for the surgical procedure. One of uh, the ones he designed and created is shown here. Um, so again, just to illustrate the operation we're going to be talking about, uh, these are the lungs, here's the heart in the center, you can see the aorta, and I've circled in blue where the obstruction is. Uh, this is the pulmonary artery, the artery going to the lungs, and because there's no blood flow to the lungs, the, the blood can't get oxygenated. And so the idea is to take this artery that's going, normally going to the arm, to cut it, and then bring it down to the pulmonary artery. So now blood comes out the aorta, and instead of going into the arm, goes into the lungs where it can get oxygenated, and then uh, the, the, the babies have oxygenated blood. Um, so they're doing this work in the laboratory when uh, Helen Tausig uh, brings this 15-month-old uh, 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 baby, Eileen Saxon, uh, and to, to uh, uh, Al Blaylock's attention. This is in November of 1944. Uh, Eileen Saxon weighed only five kilograms and could barely drink without losing her breath. Uh, Dr. Tausig diagnosed her as having congenital heart disease called tet Tetralogy of Fallot. And I'll give you, show you what that is in the next slide. And it was clear that uh, Eileen would die if nothing was done. And so let's look at this little baby's heart defect Tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, there are four parts uh, to it. One is a thickened muscle of the heart. The aorta is moved over to the side abnormally. And they have a narrow uh, uh, pulmonic valve, a narrow valve to the lungs, the artery of the lungs, so no blood can get to the lungs. And they also have this defect. And so the, the operation, again, is going to be take this artery, bring it down so that blood can get to the lungs and be oxygenated. So uh, this, despite being uh, ill-prepared, uh, uh, Al Blaylock uh, takes uh, Eileen to the operating room in November 29, 1944. And this is the first blue baby operation at Hopkins. Uh, it was felt to be so risky that even the anesthesiologist said he didn't want to participate. And so they had to get a, a backup anesthesiologist. Uh, as you can see in this photo, during the first surgery, uh, Vivian Thomas stood, stood on a, but right behind Al Blaylock. So this is Al Blaylock here in the center, and immediately behind him is Vivian Thomas. Uh, and uh, uh, Vivian Thomas helped coach uh, uh, Al Blaylock through the operation. Because now at this time, when I, the surgery was done, uh, Vivian Thomas had performed the operation about 200 times in dogs, and Al Blaylock had performed it only once and as Vivian's assistant. So he really was flying blind, if you will. And uh, Dr. Haller, who used to be the head of pediatric surgery here, felt there was a question of trust that uh, uh, Dr. Blaylock trusted Vivian Thomas to guide him uh, through the surgery. Um, and uh, again, uh, Bill Longmire, who was there, and Denton Cooley uh, described it. And uh, I'll read some quotations from them. At operation, we lacked all the modern vascular instruments and really had very little but the professor's determination to carry us through the procedure, certainly the most difficult I've ever seen. And Denton Cooley, I remember when Dr. Blaylock took the clamp off that subclavian artery and blood began to flow back into the pulmonary artery, we watched the baby turn from blue to pink. And um, I'm going to play an audio recording. This is a uh, uh, an interview of Vivian Thomas. It's, it's faint, so if you can turn up the volume on your computer at this point, uh, and you can hear Vivian Thomas describe uh, the operation, and again, how he was really the only one who had done the surgery in the dog lab, and how Al Blaylock depended on it. So I'm going to, I'll play this now, and again, it's faint, so if you can turn up the volume uh, on your uh, computer. I think it's very interesting. Uh whether the, the, the thought I have is, is, as you say, Dr. Blaylock needed the moral support, but uh, is there not an element here, perhaps, that really, when these initial vascular studies were being done in the laboratory, you were the man, probably, who was doing the majority of the actual surgery, was it a matter that he really hadn't done that much vascular surgery, and when here he was in a clinical situation? Uh, well, that's exactly what, what happened. Yes. 
Yeah. I mean, I had done all of them. Right. When it, uh, uh, the day or two days before he got ready to do Eileen, matter of fact, it was two, maybe three days before he got ready to do Eileen. Who was the first one? The Eileen Saxon. Yes. The very first baby. It was done. Uh, he arranged to come over to the lab and help me do one. Right. He had stood over and watched me from time to time. He'd come in sometime right in the middle of things. I mean, yes. he never knew exactly when yes. he was coming. And sometimes he would get there during the time I was doing one. Or some something else. So, but I mean, he just dropped in, and I worked. I didn't work according to his schedule. I worked. I set up my own schedule to work. I mean, he gave me projects, mm -hmm. and what you know, an outline of what's to be done and what projects to keep going. So that uh, whatever he was doing didn't uh, matter unless he asked me to try to schedule something at a particular time. So he'd walk in and see me doing one. I don't think. I don't think he ever just stood and just watched one from start to finish right. until he actually got ready to, to, do, to do one. And he came That's over and so said he would help me uh, do one. And um, which he did. And as I said, this was two or three days before Eileen was done. And he was planning on helping me do one and then doing a couple himself. And Eileen's condition was such that they couldn't the, wait. Plus his time. Yes. I mean, being restricted. Sure. The amount of you know work he was doing himself, that he didn't. He never had time to come back and actually do one of them himself. So he went to the operating room for number one on the basis really of having assisted you mm -hmm. at uh, one yeah, pulmonary um, subclavian yeah, anastomosis. That's right. Because even the work that I built, the work that we done on the pulmonary hypertension, he, he hadn't, hadn't done any of those at all. Right. I mean, uh, Santa Lee and I had Yes. And of course, then you, you won't then admit this, want. but it just makes you obviously the most unsung hero, in a sense, uh, in the annals of medicine for quite some time. This yeah. is. Uh, and as I think, very frankly, as Dr. Farrower said to me, he put it in in very strong terms in his discussion of Dr. Blaylock. He said he thinks the record ought to be put down somewhere. That it was Mr. Vivian Thomas who is the man who really should get an awful lot of credit that has gone Dr. Blaylock for this particular procedure. Well, I'll let you get story on stake here. So I, I hope you get a sense how uh, one, how ill-prepared Blaylock was. He'd never done a case from start to finish. He'd only popped in occasionally to watch Vivian do it, uh, Mr. Thomas do it, and also how articulate Vivian Thomas was. And if you go to the Chesney Medical Archives, you can see his uh, notes on the different procedures, clearly a very smart, very talented man. Um, and here's some quotations from the operating room, uh, which I just love. Um, uh, and these are uh, Al Blaylock, who uh, would do, say these, uh, ask these questions either as teaching or because of insecurity. Uh, will the subclavian reach the pulmonary once it's cut off and divided? Is the incision long enough? Is this all right, Vivian? The other direction, Dr. Blaylock, Vivian replies. Only in Vivian is to stand there, meaning immediately behind him. Now you watch, Vivian, and don't let me put these sutures in wrong. You can see how uh, absolutely dependent uh, Al Blaylock was on Vivian Thomas. Um, the operation is a success uh, to describe Vivian, Vivian Thomas, to quote Vivian Thomas, the way she came around, that child stood up in bed after one week. You have never seen such a change. It was almost a miracle. Um, sadly, uh, Eileen's heart failure returns and she dies shortly before she turns two. But this established the principle uh, that surgery could be used to help children with congenital heart defects. Um, and even though they didn't technically operate in the heart, it's the, the start of modern heart surgery in the United States. Um, they published uh, the first three patients in JAMA, um, and uh, Vivian Thomas is not mentioned in the article. Uh, children come from around the world to Hopkins to be saved. And by 1951, they'd done over a thousand of these uh, blue baby operations with a mortality rate of less of uh, 5%. So 
quite dramatic. And Denton Cooley describes how in each one, when they took the clamp off the pulmonary artery, they would look around just to see the, the baby turn from blue to pink. Um, so for uh, those of you who are squeamish, I, I just want to warn you that uh, 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 I'm next going to show a one minute film of surgery. And this is a blue baby operation on a five-year-old boy. And so uh, if you feel free to look away and I'll tell you when we're back on the normal slides. Um, so this video I'm going to show you is interoperative video. The heart is going to be at the top. Uh, the aorta, the vessel coming out of the heart, and then the subclavian artery is shown here. And here's the pulmonary artery leading to the lungs, which are at the bottom. And again, the surgery is going to be to take the artery that normally would go to the, to the arm and bring it down uh, to uh, uh, the artery that goes to the lungs so that blood can get in the lungs and be oxygenated. Uh, I'm going to show the video now, and this does not have sound. So if you don't hear the sound, uh, you're not missing anything. And I love the the boy at the end, uh, to see his smile, to see his blue lips, and to see his diff different uh, uh, rascally haircuts. So again, the, this does not have uh, sound. This is from 1946. And this boy has a normal uh, oxygen saturation should be twice what it is. Notice the clubbing of the fingers with long-term lack of oxygen, the fingertips uh, enlarge. So now you see them uh, dissecting and they're isolating the, the subclavian artery that normally goes to the arm. Uh, you can see the lung at the bottom and now they've cut it and they're seeing, does it reach over to the pulmonary artery, uh, which they have isolated there. So they're testing, does it reach? Now they've made a hole in the pulmonary artery and they're suturing uh, the, the subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery. Again, the heart is at the top. Now they take the clamp off the, the subclavian artery and blood goes into the lungs for the first time in this young boy where it can be oxygenated. And now here's the boy after surgery. Those of you who are squeamish can now come and look again. This is the boy after surgery. Again, notice he still has the clubbing of his fingertips, but look at his pink uh, tongue and the beautiful smile. And you can see him as he ages uh, over time um, uh, and this uh, wonderful, uh, 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 young young man. And I love his haircut here and that smile. I think that says it all. <laughs> Sticking out his tongue at us. Um, so clearly remarkable, remarkable surgery. Um, and uh, much of it due, due to Vivian's, uh, uh, Thomas's technique. Um, and Al Blaylock said of one of uh, Thomas's operations, well, this looks like something the Lord made. Uh, an incredibly skilled uh, surgeon. Uh, after the Blue Baby operations, Vivian Thomas taught a generation of surgeons surgical technique in the dog lab at Hopkins. And Denton Cooley, uh, uh, the heart surgeon said, even if you've never seen surgery before, you could do it because Vivian made it look so simple. Um, and Rowena Spencer, I think she was the first female uh, surgery resident at Hopkins. Uh, 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 there's a quote from her when asked where she learned her beautiful surgical technique, Dr. Spencer would answer from a black man with a high school education. Uh, well, how was Vivian treated? Uh, uh, Hopkins was racially segregated at the time. He had to come in to the hospital through the back door. Um, he was asked not to wear his white lab coat in the hospital uh, because they didn't want a black man wearing a white lab coat. Uh, the hospital had segregated restrooms and uh, he was never included in any uh, articles, uh, group pictures or dinners uh, celebrating the blue baby operation, except he was invited to be the bartender at some of the dinners. Um, uh, there was an attempt to make it up to him. The old hands, which are the uh, surgery residents, all the, the graduated surgery residents at Hopkins, uh, commissioned a portrait of, of Vivian Thomas in 1971. Uh, he dies of pancreatic cancer in 1985. And John Cameron tells the story uh, that as Vivian is uh, in the intensive care unit, his autobiography is published. And uh, Dr. Cameron goes up and says, Vivian, Vivian, your book has been published. Uh, and uh, Vivian opens his eyes and, and closes them, and that was the last that his eyes were open. 
Um, so if you go now to the uh, Blaylock Surgical Building, uh, you'll see the portrait of Vivian Thomas hanging there on the side wall opposite is the portrait of uh, Al Blaylock. He was also given an honorary degree in 1976. And here you can see him with Helen Tausig uh, when he received his honorary degree. Um, there are uh, two documentaries uh, uh, kind of describing this. Uh, one is uh, from PBS, it's called Partners of the Heart. Uh, and the other is an HBO uh, kind of historical fiction documentary uh, called Something the Lord Made. Again, that's uh, uh, the words that um, Al Blaylock used to describe Vivian Thomas's uh, surgery. Um, I call your attention two weeks from today, um, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Health Equity here at Hopkins will host a free a virtual presentation of uh, the documentary Partners uh, of the Heart. It'll be from uh, 10 to 1130 and be followed by a panel discussion. And I just love this because the panelists will include an original blue baby patient who now must be 80 years old, uh, as well as relatives of uh, Vivian Thomas and uh, Coco, one of the, uh, uh, his relatives was one of my medical school classmates. Uh, the URL is there, and I'll, I'll leave it, this slide up on the screen in case you want to copy it down. Um, but it basically, it's stonetosoup.org and then uh, slash JHM for Johns Hopkins Medicine dash virtual dash event. So again, stonetosoup.org slash JHM dot dash virtual dash event. And maybe John Goldstein can send that around uh, uh, after the talk for people who want to see this. Um, so what happened to Helen Tausig? Uh, she continued a really remarkable career uh, as a pediatric cardiologist. Um, and uh, she did this despite the fact that she was almost completely deaf uh, much, much of her career. Uh, she learned to lip read and she used hearing aids with a, a large, uh, excuse me, used stethoscopes uh, that had a, a large amplifier on them uh, that uh, transmitted the sound so she could hear it. And she also used, uh, the feel of her fingers rather than a stethoscope to feel the rhythm of the little baby's heartbeat. Um, and here she is examining uh, x-ray from one of her patients. Um, and uh, to quote from her, it is the clinical errors that keep you humble. You have your sadness as well as your successes. One reads about all the successful operations, but not about the unsuccessful ones, the sorrow and back, uh, background of hard work. Um, and this is a, 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 a painting of her by Jamie Wyeth. And I, I, half the people love it and half the people don't. I, I'd be interested in what people think of this. Um, <clears throat> she's not done, uh, as many, is true of many of the greats. Um, one of her former fellows who'd been to Germany mentioned to her that a number of children in Germany were born with a birth defect, uh, focal myelia, in which they're missing a bone of their arm. Um, and so Dr. Tausig travels to German, Germany, examines the kids, and spokes, speaks with the mothers and doctors, and comes back to the United States and sounds the alarm uh, that thalidomide, which was given to some mothers at the time, causes birth defects. And so we can thank Helen Tausig for preventing countless birth defects in the United States. She wins the 1954 Lasker Award, which is some people think is the pre-Nobel Prize Award for her blue baby operation work. It wasn't until 1959 that she's promoted to full professor. Uh, Sabin, who I mentioned earlier, was promoted in 1917, was the first uh, woman uh, full professor in the history of School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Tausig retires in 1963. And quite remarkable, of the 129 papers she wrote, 41 were after her retirement. Um, in 1986, uh, she's driving with a group of friends, I think, to vote, uh, and her car is struck. She turns the wrong way down the street, a head-on collision, and she uh, dies instantly. Um, and so uh, today, there are four colleges in the School of Medicine. One is named in honor of Vivian Thomas, the other in, in, uh, another in honor of Florence Sabin, who I mentioned, uh, third in honor of Helen Tausig, and the fourth in honor of Dan Nathan. Um, all right, so now let's really, really rip the Band-Aid off this and expose e even more uh, at Hopkins. And these are, I think when we talk in the past, we imagine it's way far in the past. But these are 
episodes that have been related to me or uh, directly uh, to me. So the people are still alive. Um, and uh, the first is from Carolyn Boytnott. Uh, uh, John Boytnott's on our faculty and, and John and Carolyn are two people I deeply admire uh, their life philosophy and their dedication uh, to serving the community. Um, and uh, John uh, Boytnott described the first integration of the open wards at Johns Hopkins in 1957. And I'll, I'll read you uh, from what John told me. The ward service was still segregated. Osler 6 was a white male floor. Osler 2 was a black male. And never the twain should meet. The word had come down in the fall of 1957 that the wards would be integrated. The AR, the assistant resident, who arranged the admissions from the emergency room was a man named Chuck Carpenter. And he saw a black man with a myocardial infarct, a heart attack, a not terribly severe one. And he called up and said is that this patient is being admitted to Osler 6, which is the white male floor. Now this is a night uh, at night and my future wife as a nursing student was doing what they did in those days. She was moonlighting as the nurse on Osler 6. And so that's Carolyn. Uh, so she's up there as a student nurse, as the sole nurse, when this guy was sent up there by Chuck Carpenter. There was an AR on the floor at the time. I won't use his last name, but his given name was Jefferson Davis. He was appropriately named. Uh, there was one room with four beds in it, and there were two or three, I don't, we don't remember exactly, at least a couple of totally comatose white males with tubes coming out and everything else, and one empty bed. Jefferson Davis said, I want that patient, this one who's alert, this black patient, in the room with the two comatose whites. My future wife, the student nurse, said, I'm not putting this alert man in, those, in with those terminal comatose people. He's going out on the open ward. Jefferson Davis said, no, he's going in the room. And they're in the hall with this bed, and she's pushing down the aisle towards the wards, and Jefferson Davis is on the other end of the bed, pushing the other direction. Well, physically, he would have probably beaten her, she beat him and the guy was admitted to the open ward. Carolyn won the battle as she generally does, as I found out later. That was the integration. So the individual patient rooms had been integrated slightly before that, but Carolyn Boytna, through the strength of her will, uh, uh, integrated the open wards at Hopkins in 1957. Um, uh, here's a second uh, example. This is a photograph of the morgue boxes that, that is in a pile of photographs uh, behind me that I, I never thought much of. And someone wanted a picture of the old morgue boxes, so I pulled it out. And um, uh, if you look, we're going to zoom in on the label of this morgue box on the right. And I don't know if you can read it, but it said whites. And so even in death at Hopkins, uh, white and black patients were segregated. Now here's the third one. Um, I graduated from medical school in 1985. And at one of my reunions, I think it was the 20th reunion, uh, at lunchtime, I was down in the, uh, the Turner area and I grabbed the little uh, lunch box and sat down and I was waiting for some of my classmates to come. And this gentleman uh, uh, came and sat down next to me with his wife. And I'm like, oh, this is gonna be boring. I gotta sit next to this guy, old guy, I don't know where my classmates. And uh, he introduced himself and I didn't really pay attention to his name. And I said, I'm Ralph Rubon, class of 1985. And his wife says, oh, that's, uh, that's funny. That's when the year my husband won the Nobel Prize for Peace. And I said, won the Nobel Prize for Peace? And um, his, this was Bernard Lau, who uh, won the 1985 Nobel Prize for Peace for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which was controversial because some uh, 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 Fox felt it was uh, supporting the Russians, uh, but he won the 1985 Nobel Prize for Peace. And then his where conversation goes on and his wife says, well, that's not the most interesting thing that happened to him. And so that's not the most interesting thing. She goes, no. And, and she said to her husband, you know, tell him about uh, when you worked in the blood bank at Hopkins. And so uh, uh, Dr. Lowne uh, tells me the story that, and these are not pictures from the Hopkins blood bank, but they illustrate the point that when he was a medical student at Hopkins, the blood bank had segregated blood. There was one refrigerator for white and one for uh, colored blood. And you can see here on the label, it's faded, but white and colored. And so Dr. Lown is there moonlighting as a medical student to make money for medical school. 
and a, a, a urology resident comes one night with dark circles under his eyes. He can barely walk because he, he's not been, uh, had much sleep for a year. And he says, there's a Southern Colonel on Marburg, two or three, uh, who needs a blood transfusion. Um, I'm from the same area and he doesn't want contaminated blood. He wants my blood. And they were the same blood type. And he said he'd pay me $50 for a unit of my blood. So Lowndes says, well, this is crazy. Why would we take blood from you? You can barely stand. Why don't we just do a vena puncture? Um, it'll look like you donated blood. We'll go and we'll get a unit of blood out of the refrigerator. So they do the vena puncture. They go to the refrigerator. There's no uh, blood in the white refrigerator. Uh, they go to the, the refrigerator with the uh, blood mark marked colored. And uh, Lowndes changes the C to a W. Apparently he was very good at doing that. Um, and hands the unit to the, to the urology resident who then goes and, and hangs the unit and gives the, the blood to the, uh, uh, the Southern uh, Colonel. Uh, the next day, the urology resident comes and says, the, the Colonel never felt more invigorated in his life. He'd like another unit of my blood. And I'll give you another 50 bucks. So they do the same thing. They do a vena puncture on the other arm, uh, take the C and a unit of blood, make it into a W, and the urology resident makes 100 bucks. Um, but he apparently has a big mouth and he starts telling everyone about it and someone gets upset and tells Al Blaylock. Al Blaylock uh, finds out about it and fires uh, uh, Dr. Lown. Um, and this is uh, from uh, uh, Bernie Lown's uh, blog. He quotes uh, Blaylock, who had a thick Southern accent, saying, never in the long history of infamy has such an immoral act been committed by someone aspiring to be a doctor. And Blaylock fires Lown from medical school. Lown protests uh, to the Association of Interns and Medical Students, uh, which was kind of a more uh, a liberal group at the time. Uh, he's then called to meet with one of the directors of the hospital. And Lown was reinstated in, in the medical school, but not in the blood bank. And Lown remembers his conversation with this director. He stated that he admired my principles, but regretted my impetuous behavior. Change has its own tempo, he continued, and must flow from the top. And I think if the story of Carolyn Boynton and, and Bernard Lau show, that's not the case. And, and in fact, as Lau says, I learned that if one wishes to affect social change, one must never walk alone and that historical transformations are lar largely bottom up. Um, a little bit more about Dr. Lau. He graduated from Maine with University of Maine with a near 4.0 grade point average, was denied admissions to Harvard because he was Jewish. Uh, quote, we have already refilled quota allotted to your people. He came to Hopkins in 1942, and uh, Lown remembers there were separate white and black wards, white and black toilets, white and black dining facilities. Even the water fountains were segregated. There were no black doctors, medical students, or nurses. Um, he joined the group I mentioned, uh, and at the time when he was a student, uh, was invited a black physician to uh, come to Heard Hall. To, to speak, and Lown uh, described it, I was dismayed to see an announcement that the meeting had been canceled. The entry to the hall was chained and a university policeman was posted in front. The next day I was summoned to the dean's office and informed I had been suspended from medical school for two days. Um, so it's almost six o'clock and I wanna leave time for uh, discussion. Uh, and I, thinking of this uh, last session, I wanted to quote from Fielding Harrison. Uh, the famous uh, medical historian, the history of medicine is in fact the history of humanity itself with its ups and downs, its brave aspirations after truth and frailty, its pathetic failures. As Matthew Arnold said of the Acta Sanctorum, all human life is there. And I think we can certainly see that uh, today. Um, and I, I really believe that we owe a special debt. Uh, although women, uh, blacks and other uh, groups uh, uh, played critical roles in the School of Medicine and the hospital. Uh, they were treated with shockingly poorly, I think. And despite the way they were treated, many uh, persevered and had a profound impact on Hopkins and on the field of medicine. And so I think here at Hopkins, we have a special obligation to our female and underrepresented minority staff, students, trainees, and faculty. And I think if we understand our history, it, it's quite clear. Again, uh, call your attention to the Chesney Medical, Medical Archives, a wonderful uh, a source, a resource. Um, and I wanted to conclude the series of four lectures uh, with words from William Henry Welsh. Uh, I think there has never been a time where the past has had more wisdom to give 
we should not go bluntly against all the teaching of human experience. And in this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there are clearly some important lessons for us to learn. Um, again, for those of you with a deeper interest in medical history, I call your attention to the Department of History of Medicine here at Hopkins. Uh, they have uh, individual classes you can take as well as uh, certificate uh, programs. The, the faculty there are simply fantastic uh, and they have some wonderful online offerings. And I'll, I'll ask John to send out the URL uh, after this uh, talk. Uh, I wanna thank John Goldstein for moderating. Uh, he's done a great job and, and I sincerely appreciate my friend and colleagues uh, help with these lectures. And I uh, wanna thank all of you for joining me.